So if we could, uh, Xavier, we could pause. Um, I believe uh, Ms. Maria Bader Sabo has, has a few words to, to say. I want to give her a chance to to express herself here. Um, you know, I want to thank her because she, she definitely brought this issue to us. Uh, and uh, we feel after you know, these six meetings, it's very important that we hear from uh, Council Member Maria Bader Sabo on this matter. So, Ms. Bader Sabo. Livability cannot be separated from neighborhoods. Lately, I have been struck with the predictions of an increase of population by 1 million by the year 2040. When one considers that it took 100 years between 1900 and the year 2000 to reach a million in San Antonio, it is apparent that the next million will be reached in only about four decades. With such accelerated growth, and much of it coming from our own natural births uh, within our existing population, it will take a very open, transparent, and inclusive government to make it a smooth road. We only have to see what is happening in other cities today where discontent and lack of trust simmers until it explodes. We never want this for our beloved city. We must always be inclusive. I think there are things that we can do now to make sure we do not exclude anyone. And a couple of them are these. In this morning's Express, there was an opinion piece by Noel Boyle, the head of NELCAP, who wrote that we need a housing policy in San Antonio. Today, the city uses certain plans and regulatory documents, such as the UDC, the tree ordinance, regulations on the Edwards Aquifer, to create development policy. The Housing Commission have made a few policy recommendations around incentives for affordable housing, zoning notices, and are working on some through the Resident Retention Subcommittee. But all these amount to disjointed documents and regulations that have to be researched and cobbled together. There is no housing policy. That is needed for many reasons, but one is to level the playing field between the development community and the public. In your comprehensive plan voted on last week, you made amendments that will protect the tier one neighborhoods. Thank you, Councilman Levino. This is proper because we are already being impacted by the effort to create more dense housing patterns. I live in one of these neighborhoods. However, as I understand it, these amendments only impact neighborhoods represented by official city sanctioned neighborhood associations. They do not mitigate impact on all the rest of the inner city in the east, west, and south sides that are vulnerable. They do not uh, have registered neighborhood associations, does not represent people who live in mobile home parks. Another lesson from Brackenridge Park planning is that as we read the plan, many of us felt that the exclusion of working class people who are users of the park was there. They have kept that park alive as a friendly, a uh, place for families for many years. Most of these are Mexican-American families. This was also brought out in the hearings. Finally, in San Antonio, we enjoy a very strong culture and a history that goes back thousands of years. The historic structures and sites that we still have and the commons that we all enjoy must be protected for everyone to enjoy. Losing this le legacy will make our city one that looks like any other city in the country. We must work hard to protect our uniqueness. That is how we represent everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Maria Um uh, <clears throat> And I just want to say uh, that we helped us begin a process that I think is very, very thoughtful. And to your point, uh, we want to make sure that it is inclusive. And we look forward to the discussion today. Because today's discussion is, is about how we match plant a park that is the city's park. So thank you for, for all your help. Uh, with that, we'll begin the citizens to be heard. Um, Ms. Ana Ramirez.
didn't think that we were going to be given the opportunity, so I don't have a prepared speech. Nevertheless, okay, I am the chair of the River Road Neighborhood Association. Brackenridge Park is our front lawn. In addition to that, we, we all grew up in Brackenridge Park. So we hold it very dear to all of us, particularly Hispanics. Now, I, I only went to four of the meetings um, for the, the vetting of the, uh, of the Brackenridge Park Master Plan. Uh, I did attend the meeting at uh, the Botanical Gardens, as well as Lions Field, as well as um, the Guadalupe Cultural Arts, and um, I forget the other name, uh, Doris Griffin Center. What I heard was consistent throughout. The first of all, as far as citizens to be heard, the essentially it was all about how all that spoke, including myself, were concerned about exclusion because the common denominator of this entire plan has been to exclude. Again, in addressing the 1.1 million that we're expected to have. It seems as if this plan is not for our people that use the park on a regular basis. One wants to put lots of walking trails, thus eliminating lots of parking spaces and access to parking and the different uh, the different um, picnic areas throughout the park. By eliminating that, again, we eliminate access. What I did hear also consistently in all of the meetings, including quite a few people from our neighborhood association, was the fact that it was, you know, totally eliminating everything that is dear to us. And insisting, and I noticed here, in, in this um, plan that you have here, still including the taking away of all of the parking spaces, and still insisting upon the grand lawn. Again, like Maria Berio Zabal indicated, this is South Texas. In times of drought and all, we have a grand lawn and elimination of trees. This is totally against what we do, what we use. And again, having a parking garage that I guess we would be then combining that with the already planned parking garage for the San Antonio Zoo. If both are one and the same, this is going to be a pretty crowded parking lot. Then how can people take like we do today and on a regular basis include um, taking families what carting with barbecue grills because the little grills there are not sufficient carting with barbecue grills and um and tarps and tents and birthday cakes and all of the things that are necessary to put on a picnic in the park thank you miss Sandias. appreciate your comments miss uh Gianna Vendon. Millennial, and the definition of a millennial 
is someone who was born between 1980 and um, 2000. Um, although the word millennial now has a different has a different connotation to someone who is wealthy, someone or upper upper middle class who has a lot of free time, um, who can live in expensive blocks, um, and who would want a master plan like this. Um, and and so I I always get um, really frustrated when I see plans that the city has and creates for millennials because I don't I wonder who are these millennials you are talking. To. <laughs> um, because most of the people that I know who are millennials that maybe use bikes, it's because we do not have, they do not have cars, because they cannot afford them, because they are in debt because of college. Um, and so, and, and still a lot of my friends, a lot of my fellow millennials who went to college, you know, still live with their parents. And so going to Brackenridge Park is still a family affair. Um, and so the, Anything that has to do with the plan has to be multi-generational. Um, and that is what I see wrong with this plan, um, is that it doesn't really take into consideration ADA accessibility, doesn't take into consideration multi-generation um, gatherings. Um, for example, my father is, um, is, is limited mobility because of a spinal problem. And so he cannot, walk that far if we had to park further away and then walk to a sitting area. And that is that is the that is the reality for many families. Um, in a few years I plan to have kids. So then I'm going to be bringing my limited mobility father with me and my kids and all our stuff. And we're gonna have to go on some sort of train to get where we have to go. That's gonna be a nightmare. <laughs> So um, what I what I really want to say though is that I think the PR in general, not just for this time, but for anything that the city does, that the park department does, really has to do better PR, better outreach. You know, um, being a grassroots um, organization, you know, we flyer, you know, we go out um, after work and we go out on our own time. We go out in the morning to taquerias. We go out at parks. And a lot of people. Um, a lot of my friends, my compañeras, you know, passed out flyers for these these things um, for the Brighton Ridge Park Master Plan meeting. They went out and they they had they even made a day out of it. They went to Brighton Ridge and they had a little like party and they just handed out flyers where they're having a party. Um, so I think we have to kind of keep that in mind. Just do better PR and do better outreach. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Randall. Ms. Graciela Sanchez. For me, the most important thing for today's conversation is process. There, as a resident, as you heard me say last Thursday, somebody who's lived here, whose family has lived here over 126 years, in the same two block radius of Veracruz, Santiago, and between uh, Navidad and Salinas, we're people who are invested in San Antonio, who love San Antonio. San Antonio is ours. And we have done so much work as a family, but also myself as the director of the Esperanza, to make San Antonio better, especially for the people who have lived here historically. But over and over, what we're seeing, and each year more and more often, is that it seems like Decisions are being made behind closed doors between city staff and the interested parties who want to do something with the city. So, Hay Street Bridge, there's even a lawsuit and it's being appealed in the fourth court of appeals. The community helped to save that bridge. The city was going to tear it down in the 1980s. The community started with Nanny Hinton collected signatures, had it saved, raised over $3 million. And then all of a sudden, Alamo's, Alamo Beer guy wants to do business, negotiates with Lori Houston, Patty Giovanni, and suddenly they've got one over a million dollars to build 
a restaurant and to do all this work for his benefit, not the community benefit. Centro de Artes, what's happening with there? What's happening with the Alameda Center? Main Plaza becomes privatized and goes into a Main Plaza Conservancy. Hemisphere, we're reading about Hemisphere in 2011 because we're not going to be allowed to vote on, on hotels that get built. Yes, now people are attacking you, Mr. Devino, but that was stuff that was happening then. But we're reading about it in the paper. We shouldn't be reading about these things in the paper. We should be part of the process. We are reading the overview of the 300 people who came to the meetings about, about this park. But it's 300 people and we're over a million folks. When we collect signatures, we're talking and knocking on doors saying, how do you feel about Hate Street Project? How do you feel about this? How do you? Thousands of people we're talking to face to face and they're telling us they're not happy. And so I appreciate this, Gabby, but slow down the process. Listen to the community. Um, you know, Travis Park. <laughs> it's just everything's being privatized and it's our public monies and they are public spaces and the public, especially your working class community who has nothing else except, you know, maybe a car to drive to Breckenridge or a car to, you know, to drive somewhere else or a bus to take. We need to have access to those. We cannot be charged. And I already know that the Whitney Museum apparently is going to have that parking lot that they're going to start charging. Um, and, and it's in the budget. And you know, we just hear about things around, you know, around the block. So please slow this process down. And thank you very much for having this discussion. Thank you, Ms. Sanchez. Uh, George Cisneros. Thank you. Uh, always nice to be here in front of our elected officials and the city staff. Y'all work so hard to get where we're at. And I only have three comments to make. One is about time. The second one is the symbolism of the direction. And the last one is amenities for tenants. The time I'm worried about is a rush to action. The park is not going to go anywhere. There is no need. You're not going to get 9.5 or 10 or an 8.3 if we rush this plan. There is no need to hurry. I think the smartest thing to do is you sometimes let the land go fallow and you'll get a better crop. I would encourage staff to slow down the process a year, maybe a term, maybe two terms. There's no rush to change Rock Ridge Park unless the other things like the symbolism of direction is important front doors usually mean welcome come into my house welcome i want you into my world i'm wondering why the front door of brackenridge park faces alamo heights Terrell hills almost park instead of the people of san antonio so directionality and its symbolism of the front door of the park is very important. Right now you can say, come to my front door. Don't worry about it. There's no back door for the people of San Antonio who can come up Broadway. Because Broadway and the park entrances from that area are amenities for the tenants who don't pay city taxes on the Broadway reach. If you look at the 37 apartment complexes built, Hildebrand, Broadway, Jones, Josephine, Grayson, Pearl, almost all of them got tax abatements. So none of the tenants pay taxes through their rent because the landlords are not paying taxes. If you look at the 1220 lofts, for instance, there's 307 units there. And the way they city planned it out was $15,000 per unit over 10 years. So we lose $4.6 million of tax money and revenue on just the 1220 loss alone. The CAN plan, we lose $5,860,000 in 10 years with the abatements that that landlord was given. So we're making Brackenridge Park into a wellness, fitness, community amenity for people who don't pay city taxes. 
And that's what really bothers me about this whole thing. We open the front door to the north, have no back door to the south, and we give away the park as an amenity to all the kids who maybe on equipment street the breakfast space goes down and moves to Mumbai for all we know. I mean it could happen on Friday. This equity group has no commitment to San Antonio. So all I'm saying is time, we don't need to rush. The park is not going anywhere. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Stubbs. Uh, Ms. Antonio Castaneda. Buenas tardes todos y gracias al Consejo, consejo por darnos eh, el espacio, eh, el espacio, que, espacio público que no, gracias que... Perdón. No. Oh, ok, he has to translate that. Okay, thank you very much. I'm just okay. thanking uh, council members for, um, uh, for, for the space, which is after all public space, is it not? Um, and so we're here today really to talk precisely about public space and we didn't know we would have citizens be heard so I too am not prepared but I do want to make a couple of comments uh, and my concern about Breckenridge Park I'd like to talk about a little bit within the context of policies framing San Antonio's growth and development which others have spoken to much more eloquently and much more specifically so my comments are broad in general but it's a concern that I have had since I have moved to San Antonio almost 25 years ago. And that is that policies, um, I see policies being developed and action taken for uh, attending to the growth and development of the city. Uh, but they're being developed without, it seems to me, consideration for the economic realities of San Antonio. And what I mean by that is that, as we know, San Antonio is, is among the uh, one of the cities, one of the five cities, with, that is most economically segregated. Now, what does that mean? And what does that mean with, when we think about policies for growth and development? Um, for me, what that reality also means is that we exist in San Antonio within a context of historical and contemporary systemic inequality. And so that's really what we're talking about in one form or another, is that what we have seen with this process has, in fact, reflected that systemic inequality. And that systemic inequality is based on race, on class, certainly on gender, and sexuality. But here, we're talking more specifically about class, and to some degree, race. Because it is Mexican-American, Mexican-Mexican-American families, largely, who use that part. And so if we do the master plan as it is currently uh, conceptualized, then what we are doing is we are removing Mexican-American families from public space. And I'd like us to think about that and what that means when the highest percentage of the population of the city is Latino and Latino. So thank you again for uh, the, the for the ability to come and speak to you in this public space. And thank you for your work. We, we really do understand that this is not easy. Uh, and we have some sense of the pressures that, uh, that befall you. But, and we're not here to, uh, to add to the pressure, but we are here to, uh, to raise our voices and to be listened to. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Castaneda. At this time, uh, I'd like to uh, ask Ms. Lynn Bobbitt of the Conservancy to, to come and say a few words. Um, this weekend, uh, we had an opportunity to take a, a tour uh, with uh, Maria Villa Gomez and my Parks Commissioner, uh, Tem Temper Martinez. And uh, joining us was also uh, Leila Powell, the mayor's office. Uh, I want to thank you for, for that uh, conversation and uh, want to give you a chance to say a few words to the Well, thank you for spending your part of your Sunday with us. Hello, council member and staff. Uh, yesterday was very exciting, and today, uh, after our tour, uh, I was 
in the park looking at the section of the dam in the Asakia. And we took pictures of some of our board is here tonight. Joe Calvert, our president, Tom Crystal, our vice president, Mary Fisher, our um, secretary. Um, and we would like to thank you for looking forward uh, in this process. The Rack Ranch Park Conservancy is standing um, uh, with you as a partner to expand the uh, collaboration with the community with the staff, with you, to create a positive move forward. Um, I am not discouraged. I think what has come about, uh, uh, my friend Maria Barrett's almost request that there be additional uh, public meetings, is encouraging and exciting. We know the community loves this <coughs> park. It is a park for the entire city. It's for all districts, not just one. And so the Conservancy recognizes that. And I have taken it to heart as I've sat through all of the meetings. There have been eight, two before the last six. And we have listened carefully to what people have said. And so this should be a slow and deliberate process that, we're, that we work with you on. We support a process going forward to identify the projects that we can all come together and support. There are things that need to be done in the park, and I did um, invite people to join me in the park for tours, as I did with Councilman Warren and Councilman Trevino. I'd like to invite you, Mr. Saldana and Mr. Medina, uh, to meet us there. It's different when you're standing looking at the needs that are required in the park. There is maintenance, and there are improvements that can be done. And there is common ground, and I respect your opinions, um, and I think we need to move in a very positive direction. This can be considered similar to what's happening at Alamo Plaza in terms of the depth of research that is beginning and will be done over a period of time. Um, uh, I would like to suggest that we do that in this instance too, and we are ready to partner with you. Thank you, Ms. Bobbitt. <clears throat> at this time, I'd also like to uh, welcome Ms. Uh, Jennifer Martinez. She serves as my park, Parks Commissioner and has uh, done a great job of doing that. Um, in fact, she's, she attended four of the meetings um, and has uh, provided incredible insight. And I want to give her a chance to give her perspective um, about this, this effort uh, as, as she joined us yesterday as well for the tour. So, Martinez. Thank you, Chairman. members of the My perspective, I attended about 75% of the sessions, including those that were at the Garden Center. Um, as Chair mentioned, my name is Jennifer Martinez, um, and I am also a member of our corporate community in San Antonio and a downtown resident uh, and an avid cyclist that enjoys the park on them. Um, I would say that in, in stepping back and looking at the, uh, at the comments that we provided during the meetings, there are really three key categories that I would place those comments in. And the first one is a sense of place. And so it's very clear that San Antonio loves this park. In fact, we, hold, we heard multiple stories, some dating back to the 1940s and 1950s, of families that had significant memories and milestones at this park. What, what we heard is that sense of action is saying, it's okay to pause, and it's okay to step back and work together. We're all San Antonio, regardless of our last names and regardless of our histories, how do we work together in a country that's working apart right now? And how do we take a chance to step back and say, Bracken Ridge means something for all of San Antonio. And so I would say our partners to the South Toyota, they do a really great job of moving this into action. In fact, the Japanese call this Genshi Genbutsu, which means go and see. And so I would encourage our really great city staff members and our leadership to go and see what are the users doing today, whether it's the elderly softball team that I had no idea about uh, that's mm -hmm. quite popular at the park, or the community uh, volunteer who organizes open uh, running nights for uh, couch to 5Ks, or those that just simply want mm -hmm. to beat the ducks. What are our users doing today, and how do we do it in a way that's both high tech, through surveys or through social media, or ways that are low tech, through knocking on doors and asking, how do you use the park today? What are opportunities that we have? What do you want to see? 
just like that single mom who said, I really love your soft heart and the knives of counsel in Saldania. And I would love just to see some type of splash pad to have for my kids and not have to be charged for it. And so I encourage the committee to continue to think about how do we really integrate the park? And I appreciate all of the work that you know, the city does. We are truly uh, a unique city that, um, that is leading the forefront when it comes to working together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. And, uh, certainly, you have uh, served as a great parks commissioner. Thank you so much. Um, so, before the presentation, uh, a couple of council members would like to say a few words. Uh, Councilman Saldana. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just want to open up with uh, I've been looking forward to this presentation today because it comes on the heels of, of a, a renewed awakening that San Antonio oftentimes has to be shaken into, uh, sometimes more vigorously than others, about the process. And I think uh, Graciela hit this on the head. We have to be reminded sometimes that if folks are going to buy into the ultimate product or outcome, they need to buy into the process from the beginning. So I've been looking forward to today because it's going to give us an opportunity to at the very least hear a bit of the process or the, the input that wasn't captured to, to begin with. And in, in a situation like this, where we have a park like Rackenridge that is filled with so much tradition and legacy, uh, you really have to go as slow as you must. And, and, and I think for this committee, who will ultimately uh, move something forward to the, to the full council, uh, we should come to, a, come to a consensus or a decision about what we do, recognizing the fact that we may have put the carpet before the horse on the process in terms of going out and, and coming up with ideas that haven't yet been filled with the color of those people who are using uh, the park. So uh, yeah, I've heard a lot of really great things from, from our speakers, uh, in specific, you know, I appreciate Gianna's nod to the multi-generational fingerprints that have been placed on Brackenridge Park. So when any one of those fingerprints is rubbed off, I think it gives the community a sense that things are changing and not necessarily to their benefit. Attaching to that is things like the fact that maybe the barbecue or the access or the, 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 the Easter picnics don't happen like they used to. And I think that's just part of the much a part of the DNA of Rackham, uh as the future plans for a new uh, inclusion of, of, of amenities. But I, I'm, I'm just reminded briefly of, of the process that we took to try to come up with visions and dreams for Pearsall Park. And we were very convinced that if we did not have the community's buy-in at the get-go, that we could not accomplish something that would be uh, would, would satisfy folks at the end of the day. We know that things are not going to be perfect, but as long as folks feel like they're part of the process, uh, and, and we did that very early on before we even committed ourselves to the amount of money we were, we were looking for. Um, I, think, I think we need to get it right here on, on, on Brackenbridge. So uh, as we leave today, I think we should come up with a sense of whether it may, makes sense for us to refresh the process here, to restart the process, um, and make sure we're getting it right from the get-go. So uh, I'm looking forward to the presentation and ultimately what we decide to do. Thank you, Councilman. I think we all look forward to this discussion today as well. Councilman Ward. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you all for coming out uh, to the numerous meetings and the numerous times that I've seen you in the community. Um, looking at the passion that was, especially at the, at the events um, recently, uh, that kind of leads to my dreams of people being passionate about all the items that come up in San Antonio, because I, I think we still need hundreds of more people to engage in this conversation to really make this a community effort. But we've definitely uh, made a step here to make things better for our city. And I, and I applaud you all for your passion um, in moving this process forward. I also uh, think that this was definitely needed. And um, the, I mean, the, the fact that we are uh, definitely having a, a committee meeting at 6 o'clock in the evening shows that we're attempting to do our part to make things more accessible. And, and we need your feedback to hear um, if these things are working. So we, we appreciate the feedback that, that's come through this process as we know that it has not only changed this process and, and the future of, of Brackenridge Park, but future processes that we have. So hopefully we've learned from our um, earlier uh, missteps and that we can uh, focus on doing this on the front end as opposed to the back end, or at least the perceived front end as opposed to the back end. So I, uh, definitely think that we're heading in the right direction. We're not there yet. And there are definitely improvements that we can make 
in the process, but also in our public facilities so that we can make them more engaging. I appreciate uh, George's remarks in regards to the, the front door being a place where people should feel welcome. And um, I've had issues with some of the places in my district that uh, are in the community, but don't seem to be for the community. And um, I don't want that for Brackenridge Park, and I know you don't want it either. So I, I think we can all work together to make this a, uh, a more meaningful experience, but also a more meaningful park for more San Antonio. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Councilman Weiner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I also uh, really also look forward to this presentation tonight as well, because I'm reminded of how important what Brackenridge Park means to all of us, whether you're from San Antonio or not. I think you recognize how beautiful that uh, Brackenridge is, and uh, it's not lost upon me or this committee how important it is for us to make sure that we get this process right and but we can't do that without you all so i'm very encouraged to see so many different folks from all across the city here tonight to ensure that we uh, we, we get this process uh, right and we get the input that we need so that we can move forward with the full council to make sure that we have enough citizen input and we recognize what uh rack and Ridge means to all of us as San Antonians to our community as well so Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. With that, uh, we can go ahead and uh, begin our presentation. And Xavier, I'd like to thank you for all your hard work. Uh, so when this came up, uh, we met quite frequently, and I want to thank your, your responsiveness. Uh, I want to thank the team as well for, for helping to host these six meetings citywide, and we look forward to this presentation. Uh, it was it really meant to a lot of hard work, and I uh, want to reaffirm that we are listening so, Jeruka, please. Thank you, uh, Chair and uh, Committee. So, uh, we're providing a briefing on uh, the uh, imp input we received from the additional public meetings that were held in response to the draft master plan. So, just a quick uh, update from the presentation that was provided to the Neighborhoods and Livability Committee back in March 29th. Just a reminder, we were going through a, master, a draft master plan process our uh, design consultants, our Rialto Studio is the lead uh, with uh, three other partners that are uh, working in tandem with them on the master, master uh, draft, the draft master plan process. So uh, at that uh, March 29th meeting, uh, some items were presented to the committee when that draft was provided uh, both to the public and to Mayor and Council which talked about some of the issues that had been identified with uh, Brackenridge. Uh, those range really from everything from diminished uh, environment to accessibility, uh, the amount of impervious covered parking and, and uh, traffic and uh, wayfinding type of issues within the whole park. So as part of the draft, the committee, or I'm sorry, the consultants came up with five uh, areas so as part of that draft that was presented, five strategies were identified to address some of those uh, issues, those current issues with the park. The first was to restore natural park features and improve water quality. So can you go your one slide ahead? I'm sorry. So um, thank you. Sorry about that. So uh, again, so to address some of these issues, five strategies which were outlined in the draft master plan. The first one was restore natural park features and improve water quality. The second one was to restore and preserve the, and articulate the park cultural and historic features. So that deals a lot with some of the historic st structures and features of the park, the Sakia system, the water work system that are in the park. All those are history and um, speak to the growth of San Antonio and the development of San Antonio and are all located within the park. Uh, increased park visibility and pedestrian access was really addressing how the park is viewed uh, from the perimeter. Is there a common area? Is there um, um, a central theme of how you approach the park? And then another, the other last two were, one was to recapture green space in lieu of impervious covered parking. And then the other one was to reduce vehicular traffic through the through the uh, use of street closures and the tram system. So that's what was in this five strategies. So after we had our neighborhoods and livability meeting in March, 
We held a public meeting in April at the San Diego Botanical Center, Garden Center. And at that meeting, uh, the items were presented. And there was definitely some conversation and some concerns about some of the areas, particularly around the parking and uh, the closure of streets. At that same time, after that meeting, uh, Councilman Trevino was approached by members of the community that felt that that one meeting really didn't allow enough opportunity for what we consider the historic park user. So it didn't allow enough opportunity for the public at large and the public across San Antonio to really engage in the conversation of the draft master plan. So at that point, we um, came with a plan to conduct six additional meetings. Uh, those were all advertised both in English and Spanish through the newspaper, La Prensa. Uh, we had um, radio spots on everything from NPR to Spanish language uh, media. We did um, a dedicated website for to put the draft master plan uh, out on, in the internet and to allow people to comment on it. And then we also uh, advertised the six meetings by, along with some of the people in the community who went out and walked in the park, we did as well. So on the weekends, we had staff that went out and gave flyers out for people using the park so that we really felt we could try to broaden the depth of the engagement uh, beyond the one meeting that was at the Botanical Park. So we did have uh, the six additional meetings. We had a total of 363 undefeated attendees because there were some attendees who attended more than one meeting but at all the meetings 384 104 citizens spoke and we received um over 103 103 comment cards as well as the verbal um, communication that was provided uh, the meetings varied everything from the largest meeting which is the lion's meal we had 103 attendees uh, and then we, the next largest was at the Guadalupe uh, Cultural Arts Center where we had 94 attendees. Um, the zip code reflects that where we had double digit attendees from the zip code, there were, there were five zip codes that, that these, these uh, individuals came from. So for example, what you would expect around the park, this park is surrounded by 78209 and 78212, we had 64 individuals from the 78209 and 40 from the 78212. Uh, and then it varies based on going a little bit further and a little bit west. But again, I think what it uh, exemplifies is the message did get out, in particular, I think, to people that either live near the park or also are visiting the park from uh, other areas of the city. So out of that, sorry, this was fast. Out of that, those public meetings, we had an exercise that allowed the public to respond to those different five strategies we talked about. Where there is general public support, we're around the strategies around the natural resources, around the uh, historical features of the park, as well as increased park visibility and the connectivity to the neighborhoods. Those are the ones that really overwhelmingly and we have attachments that were here and we have the pamphlets that kind of give all the different percentages of the different components of those but those overwhelmingly had public support the areas that did not were dealing with the people mover about reducing parking within the park closing roads within the park and um i think that last one is Reduce impervious cover was supported. So I'm not sure. Oh, that one got in there. That that one was supported. But those were the main areas that there was not support for. So what staff, uh, what we are proposing is that we move forward with uh, completing the exercises, moving toward the finalization of the master plan. But the, the areas, now back up right here, the areas where there was not some public, public support, that those areas not be included in the final master plan that would be uh, presented to council. So that master plan would not include any type of tram system, system or uh, people mover. It would not include any reduction of parking within the park.
park and that it not include any road closures within the park. We would though recommend that there be a section in the draft master or in the final master plan that at least spoke to that there are issues around probably vehicular traffic and pedestrian traffic and mobility that would need to ultimately be addressed, but probably in a much more engaged fashion and just targeted on those subjects so that it's not about, you know, uh, you know, restoring the acequias and talking about uh, how do we maneuver with people and cars, but that conversation only be about that if that conversation is ever to move forward again. Uh, but in this plan, we would recommend those three areas not be included uh, moving forward. And we're available for any questions. All right, so look at, uh, we had one more person signed up to speak. Uh, I think it says here, Artie Trejo. Yeah. Mr. Trejo. Thank you so much for your time and giving me time to speak. Uh, that, uh, 
Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Hill. And our apologies for not seeing the seeing you on the list. Um, we want to make sure everybody's heard. Uh, <clears throat> Chair, if I can make one correction, I'm sorry. I I misspoke. The the last strategy, the last item on the not public, which was the impervious cover, is correct. Reduce the impervious cover. I was thinking invasive species and habitat re uh, restoration, but I, I got myself confused. So that item again did not have public support um, in, in the plan. So I just wanted to clarify that. Okay. Thank you. So, um, and before we continue with questions, I, I want to recognize that tomorrow uh, the San Antonio Zoo is here. Uh, we also got a great tour of that zoo this weekend. Uh, doing an incredible job in that zoo. I want to thank you for being here. Uh, you really are engaged, uh, not only with this issue, but with the community and city process. And certainly appreciate all that you're doing. Would you like to say a few words? Sure. Thank you. Thank you uh, to the committee and to of course, the city staff and the conservancy and the community that's all been working on this. For me, it's very exciting to see all the passion in the city about Breckenridge Park and all the attention that it's getting. It's it's truly the park in San Antonio that you can say everybody uses, so it's a very exciting time for us. Um, and it's got really three layers to it. There's this historic, incredible historic layer with the acequias and the waterworks. Um, there's a recreational layer that we know with the families that have been coming there for generations, which is very inspiring to see. And then there's a natural layer to the park. You know, it's really a, a wonderful green space in the lung of our community. So it's very important for many reasons uh, and to many people. Um, just a little bit of clarification on the garage, but I know it's come up, has come up a couple of times. The zoo's been working independently on a garage since my arrival in December of 2014. Right when I came on board, um, San, my SA had uh, brought a poll of community um, and uh, asked where's parking in San Antonio and of course Brown Ridge Park <laughs> one hands down. So we've been working on this. It's an issue of the park accessibility, traffic and parking are big issues. Um, today I walked just from um, the corner of Toledo and Champion down to the front of the zoo and 52 negative signs coming in talking about our front door entrance. Um, 52 negative signs, no parking, tow zones, and things like that between um, Champion, the stadium and the zoo and then going the other way towards um, Pugles, there's 20 signs. So 72 signs in about half a mile stating no parking, tollway zones, things like that. So it's not a very welcoming experience in the park. And what we're trying to do with our parking garage is build a garage on a school district parking lot that people are already utilizing to access the park, just adding another 600 spots. And we want this garage to be free for the community to come down and use to access the zoo, yeah. the, the park, the Whitney, the museum, and all the great attractions that are down there. So I just wanted to clarify one of those points with our garage. It's been independent. It just happened to um, also align with the master plan to build garages on the perimeter of the zoo on uh, the park on non-park property, so that's what we're saying with our project. And I'll be there afterwards if you want to ask questions or talk. And thank you for coming out. I'll you to the zoo when you come and visit and do tours. And we're happy to have you and happy to be engaged with the community. Thank you, Mr. Long. Appreciate it. Okay, Mr. Rudia. So I think what's really neat about uh, what has occurred over the summer is that uh, top of mind has been Brackenridge Park. In fact, well, no offense to the other parks in our city, but, but Brackenridge Park showed why it is an important park citywide. It was, uh, it really was the <coughs> park we were all talking about. And uh, my hope is that we can turn that into an incredible uh, positive momentum for, for our city and for this park. Um, you know, you talked about some of the items uh, that, that were met with some positivity. Can you speak, speak to some of those items that were? You know, sure, that were sure. So, for example, one of them was restore natural park features and improve water quality. So, because the San Antonio River runs through the park, uh, there are a lot of opportunities to improve the way stormwater runoff reaches the San Antonio River to reduce the amount of pollutants that uh, reach the river. So, there was, you know, in the master plan, it talks about using low, imp low impact design features, which are really water cleansing type of features through vegetation and bioswells, things that are natural, not anything um, mechanical, but from pure, purely a natural landscaping environment. Talked about um, also the Catalpa Pershing, which is um, kind of somewhat is a moat to Brecker Ridge Park <laughs> to Broadway uh, that is uh, a concrete ditch that serves as uh, for stormwater runoff. And using and restoring that, making that in that eco restoration, having it look more natural, very similar to like the Mission Reach of the San Antonio River, where you're able to maybe have some 
bike and hike trails next to it, but it again serves as a natural environment for birds, for wildlife, and not you know just a, a basically a man-made drainage channel that separates the park from the park. Uh, Brackenridge, Mr. Colonel Brackenridge had Santino Waterworks, so the Sakia systems and the uh, some of the waterworks. Uh, tunneling systems are still present in the park. Uh, the pump house, the original pump house, that where water was used to be channeled, those are all still uh, existing within the park, but are in disrepair, uh, have, you know, over time, uh, have need some uh, work to either uh, restore them or repurpose uh, them into more, maybe a, a use that is compatible with uh, park users today. Uh, and then the last one talked about the perimeter of the park. Really, if you think about Breckenridge Park, and there's you know, really like signage and a common theme or look, so that when you're entering Breckenridge Park, you really feel like you've arrived and you've gotten to the park. So that receives some public, I mean, some positive uh, feedback in the idea of how do we approach the park and know that you are there, uh, that you're not going the wrong way, you're trying to get to the witty as opposed to the zoo, and, and wayfinding and directional things of that nature. Those were the three strategies that had overwhelming public support. And this question would go to Ms. Via Gomez. Uh, you know, uh, we both got a tour of, of, of the park. You guys see some of the, the items here. Speak to some of the, uh, the availability of funds for preferred maintenance and, and what you saw uh, regarding that and that uh, capacity to address those issues. So what we, um, one of the areas that we know that needs some maintenance is the retaining walls at Baton Ridge Park. And over the past couple of years, we have been investing uh, roughly about half a million dollars um, to, to make some of those repairs. The 2017 budget that the city manager will be presented to the council on Thursday is recommending the commitment of $500,000 to continue with those repairs. Um, also, the Amira Flores Park uh, is in need of some uh, repairs as well. Uh, some of the structures are uh, historic and we need to preserve them. So we are including in the budget $300,000 dedicated to that park. So that's what we have in our operating budget and within our general fund. But uh, we are aware that the need is, is well beyond those $800,000 that I mentioned. So one of the areas that we're looking at is the bond program. And as uh, Mike Frisbee presented some of the very early uh, proposals for consideration of the council and the community, is roughly about $7.5 million that could be utilized to make improvements to the park. So one of the areas that, uh, as Xavier mentioned, and the community has noticed is some of the structure, uh, structural aspects of the park. Uh, the catalpa, um, a drainage ditch that needs to be uh, repaired, the retaining walls, and, um, and overall to make the park more attractive, uh, to also uh, get rid of some of the invasive vegetation that we have in some of the areas of the park so we can feature some of the architectural aspects of the park in a much um, better functional way. So, so that is how we um, as staff are making those recommendations for council consideration to address some of those maintenance issues that are necessary to make to our Rocket Ridge Park. And some of these items when we're talking about, uh, they're somewhat timely because they're, they're being held by temporary, uh, temporary structures, is that correct? So that's, that's correct, Councilman. So we, when we started the program with the deferred maintenance to address some of the river walls, we only had a small section of failure or blowout. Uh, since that time, there have been two other large areas uh, that have uh, appeared. One near the Woody Museum, uh, that's right next to the um, development improvements they've made, and then this other piece down by Lambert Beach, another large section. So uh, one of the challenges we're having to, it's not a challenge, but one of the, you know, the, the differences as opposed to any other wall is that in a lot of these cases, we end up uh, creating a new refortified wall, and the old historic mason work goes on top of that almost as a facade. 
So it's not as easy as us ripping something out and putting something in new, engineered. We actually have to deliberately and purposely take apart what's there and we're able to salvage it and then build the engineered piece and then go back and put that old historic mason work back in so that again it keeps the integrity of the historic feature of the park. The park is on the National uh, Register of Historic Places. There's all kind of state designations as well. So uh, it's a very different from any other park too that we cannot just come in and make major changes to the park. The park itself and the integrity of it, at least physically, has to stay intact. And that's certainly an important piece for, for a park like this because of all the history I got to see some of this just yesterday, in which uh, there's there's pieces of, uh, pieces of this park, the historic park, that are preserved by being covered up. Is that correct? Correct. So actually, um, you know, it's one of those uh, people really not knowing that much about the historic features have in some way helped preserve some of them because they're either covered or people do not really visit those areas of the park or frequent them very often. Uh, but at the same time, it doesn't bring awareness and the public will to see some of those improvements made. So uh, some of the acequias, some of the walls have been covered, some of the soot or um, in the fill that has occurred in parts of the river are somewhat holding up and protecting some of the historic areas. And so that's another component that makes it a little challenging. When we are making those improvements, is not only with the actual wall itself, but everything else that's around it. So if um, almost every inch of Red Ridge Park is an archeological significant site. And so anytime we do anything there, we usually have UTSA out doing a dig, looking at it, the, the park itself is just rich in both prehistoric, historic, pre-colonial, German settlers, I mean, the history of San Antonio is in that park, and so anything we do, we have to do it very carefully and very deliberately. So let's, let's go back to the items that, that, were, uh, that were looked at as, as, as negative or pieces. Let's reaffirm what we don't want. Let's, let's go to that next. So what we heard in the public comment and we saw across the board, both in the exercise where people went to the boards and were able to identify areas that they support and not support, uh, both the common cards, I would say the number one thing that people were really against was the people mover or the tram. The concept of having some type of system where you're required to be able to navigate within the park only through the utilization of this mechanism was not supported very strongly. Uh, the net really dealt with reducing parking. And what that was, again, what we heard were people that felt the uh, accessibility of being able to drive right into Brighton Ridge Park, to drive very close to maybe your destination, whether it's a specific picnic pad or place where you're used to picnicking or wherever that is, and being able to have that parking readily available and so convenient was something that people did not want to give up. Uh, and the other was road closures. And again, the concern there was, again, uh, and I can relate to that, you know, Brackridge Park is kind of a, a motor park in a certain way, and so part of that was the ability of being able to drive through the park from one, one area to another, to be able to uh, not have to walk if you didn't want to, uh, and the ability to be able to, as part of your enjoyment, being able to experience, you know, as you're driving through the park, the wonders of it and the nature of it. So people were not in, uh, in favor of uh, closing any of the existing streets. And then the reduced impervious cover really gets speaks to the parking lots. So one of the things that the consultants looked at was how do we recapture some green space within the park? How do we get some of that back? But unless you're eliminating a building or parking, the impervious cover is existing. And so uh, the community through this process was not in favor of removing any of the parking or any of the uh, structures that are there today. Um, let's talk about some of the comments, because I think it's, it's really neat just to receive this report of some of the comments that we received in the news. There were all kinds of comments. 
you your take on some of the more surprising comments about the book. Um, I don't think they were necessarily surprising. I think uh, everyone, at least um, who, especially from the park perspective, we know how popular it is, uh, especially at Easter and the holidays. Uh, that's something that the Parks Department um, embraces. You know, we make we go uh, to extra efforts that during those holidays we provide facilities, whether that's additional portlets, uh, additional uh, roll-off trash containers, uh, whether it's volunteers going out and handing out recycling <coughs> bags for recycling of bottles and cans. So that is something that uh, we are very aware of, and again, we embrace and celebrate every year. Um, you know, we get uh, a media release that we put out right about a week before Easter, you know, listing all the parks within the city of San Antonio that you're able to camp in overnight. So that's something that we're, you know, we're very aware of. I think probably some of the things I think that were the most surprising really dealt with the, um, the ability to drive through the park. I think we do have some challenges of people who use the park as a cut through to get to other um, destinations that's not within the park, uh, to put it bluntly, but I think there are other methods that consultants can look at that do not require the closure of park to maybe mitigate for some of that. So I think that was one of the ones that I was a little bit more surprised that um, across the board, you know, not closing any of the streets um, was well, what the... Was it one of the comments about uh, the golf course? Yes. So there was a conversation around, around the golf course, which itself is historic. Uh, and it was kind of one of these, if, instead of you know, reducing parking and adding a great lawn, why not just recapture the golf course and open that up and then you, know, you wouldn't have to lose parking. Um, that is you know, a whole different subject and a whole policy discussion around that. It is part of the Municipal Golf Association. It is one of six courses. Uh, it is, I would say, the backbone of the system. Uh, financially, it helps support the other golf um, courses that we have in the community, whether they be in District 8 or District um, 3. Um, you know, all the ones uh, that we have through the system are supported mainly by Breckenridge. And again, it is a story. So that was a little bit of a surprise. Uh, but I think that kind of goes with the idea of uh, the public really looking at alternatives, trying to trying to participate and say, you know, we don't like this idea, but if the goal we're trying to reach is goal A, we think there's other strategies to reach there. And they all should be considered, and we agree that that is a great exercise because if we're going to look at something, it needs to be looked at and look at all the strategies. And all the strategies may not work, just like some of these strategies didn't work. Uh, and but that doesn't mean they shouldn't be vetted and at least explained and explored. Well, and I agree with you. I think that uh, you know, in reading some of these comments, and there's quite a few. Uh, one of the website comments that, that I that I found that I found very intriguing. And so the park has been a driving park since horse and buggy days. I thought that was great. Mm -hmm. um, you know, talk speaks to history and it speaks to how people feel very much connected to their park and, and what, it, what it means to be San Antonio and what it means to be a little different from other places. Um, you know, it, it also talks about involving the people who use the park. Uh, I mean, I think these are all uh, very worthy comments and really speak to the passion uh, of our city and the passion for this park. Um, you know, seeing that, that there's, there is uh, some items that are just non-starters, uh, I think we can safely say that we, we will not be pursuing those. Um, certainly, uh, I would like to talk about, as has been, has been mentioned, you know, there's no, there's no need to rush. Um, I believe my own parks commissioner said, come see it, I love that. Um, because that's probably uh, offer some opportunity to, to, to really further build on the trust that that, that we we need to we need to earn uh, with, with our community. Um, all too often, we we are we're doing a process that that uh, you know, sometimes uh, makes people feel left out. And this park has been top of mind all all summer long and I think that's really great. It's an opportunity to sort of carry that momentum, carry that wave. And I just want to say as chair uh, of this committee, I 
and want to say that you know we're, we're not going to do this process without you, without the community. And we feel that that's a very important process uh, as a state you know, of all the people who actually use the park. Uh, with that, do you think there's an opportunity to uh, s slow this down a bit and reaffirm some of these positive items? If we can go, let's switch the slide over to the positive stuff. Um, if we take if we take some of these things that are supported and then build on some of these comments and ideas where we're actually involving uh, the community input and doing it at the park. So, so now it's no longer looking at the drawing and using red dots, but rather uh, finding a more innovative approach to community involvement, community engagement at this park to truly master plan this, to truly say this is, this is what it feels like. Uh, I, can, I can only imagine uh, there's nobody in here that could argue with a kid who, who would actually tell you the cold hard facts about how something should be uh, at a park. So, you know, we've had this discussion, and, and I, I see an incredible opportunity here to, to have a more engaged process with the community, maybe an innovative approach to master planning. Uh, speak to us about that. Is that something we could do and then maybe come back to neighbor? Sure, yes, Councilman. I think definitely, I think what we saw is, you know, the, the draft was a draft. It's always been a draft. Nothing, uh, there's nothing that's been finalized with it. And I think through the, you know, through the work of the community and yourself, we've been able to uh, enlarge that conversation. But that conversation today has been focused around those areas that were the most concerned. So I think if we move forward and we have those areas off the table, that allows us then now to concentrate on the areas where there is a consensus and where there is support, and how do we even grow that further? How do we make sure that when we're moving through these areas where there is general support, that we are doing it the correct way and the way that reflects what the general public is expecting to see at the end? And I think that's critical because um, you know, we're, we have right now our concepts and some renderings, but as you all have said, when you're actually out in the park, it is a different environment. You see some of the historic structures and you get to hear the story about them and understand how they were used and how they're not being used today or could potentially be used today. That's a different type of engagement than through an exercise that was done to date. So there is something we could do where we actually uh, do some on-site engagement, um, you know, for lack of a better word, some type of charrette exercise, but it's a little bit um, more um, interactive and uh, more engaging with the park user on-site. Yes, and, I, and I, I would say, you know, we would want to deploy whatever is available to us to, to help with that experience. The, the idea is, whether it's a mock-up, a charrette, um, you know, so utilizing some of uh, the highest technologies down to zero technology, very, very low tech, uh, to help people understand what that experience might be. I think that would, that would be a, a worthy cause, and it could certainly help uh, uh, innovate this process to, to truly include the community and the users of the park as part of, of what we're doing uh, at this park. Um, and Councilman, if I may add, I think one of the conversations that Xavier and I had is that we would like to take the opportunity, all the comments that we got from the public, to do something that we should have done from the very beginning, and that is to engage the community at the beginning of the process, even before we uh, brought the, the draft uh, recommendation to the Neighborhood Center of Ability. So we are uh, excited about this opportunity to uh, take uh, the input and the comments that we got from the community, and as Xavier mentioned in, in your conversations as well, to do an innovative approach to bring the community to the park and, uh, and talk about those um, potential improvements that we can make to, to the Brackenbridge uh, Park. Thank you. I, I think you know, I think everybody could get excited about that to be really truly be an engagement piece, and I think it'll help sort of keep the, this part uh, top of mind as we go into the fall. Uh, Councilman Sabine, a few words. Sure. I mean, I just want to add on top of that that the councilman and I have had a few conversations about what is the next step here, understanding that there were some mistakes made um, at the beginning of this process, and so um, we need to understand. 
whether we want to admit it or not, uh, the city has made mistakes around transparency and inclusion uh, on, on this process, but also other processes. And what we're trying to say with this example is that we actually would not be here but for uh, the community actually finding the, the issue without our help, found it on their own, brought us to a point where we're questioning whether this actually is a piece of plan at the end of the day with regard to the, the plan for Breckenridge. And we need to learn something from this lesson. We need to learn that, that oftentimes, not just with Brackenridge, but other things that we're taking on in the city, public projects um, that we're too often putting forward a product that doesn't yet include the first part of that, that, uh, that voice, which is the community voice, the people who are using it. That's why I think the strategy, which is sort of a hybrid, is taking it out to the community where we know there will be members and users, in this case, Brackenridge Park, asking them about what they envision in this area as a park user today and doing that multiple times over but if there's any lesson to be learned here i think is what you're you're getting to is that uh, if we are missing out especially on a project like this on a community and they can easily criticize us like they have on this one uh, at the end of the day when saying look this is a draft plan that's almost halfway baked if not fully baked and we still have yet to hear about it and i think that's what we're trying to uh, get it get it completely right on. Um, so the only question I would, I would ask if I can share is, are we now making a statement of the fact that the, what is read, what is we've heard from community members that we do not want to see in the future of Bracken Bridges? Right? Are we moving these off the table? Correct. We would, we would not move an item forward that would include these items that did not have the public support. That would have been with the normal process of a draft master plan to begin with, I think the issue we have here is the public process that we did have in place, because there was one, that was not inclusive or robust enough, and that's what we try to do when we correct that with the draft, is to take that draft master plan out. And I think what we're gonna see now is, because even when we look at the zip codes, how it still is very concentrated in the areas neighboring the park, I think if we're really looking at park users and really engaging that component, I think this next exercise of taking something out to the park and doing it in the park when people are there, we'll, we'll get some feedback from that. I think that's something that has not traditionally been done uh, through any of our master plan processes in the park. Uh, and I think it's a good, it's a deal good test for us to see what kind of engagement do we get, what kind of information, and to bring that back to the committee. Because either we'll get some really good <coughs> feedback or we may hear that people aren't engaged but we don't know at this point and I think that's a that's the thing is we can't answer that and I think I think at the end of the day we'll, we'll get engagement because we're gonna make it fun I mean we're not we're parks we're not gonna do something that's not fun so part of that is we're gonna make it fun we're gonna add other type of activities to it because at the end of the day you know I've always said through all the years I've presented to you uh, mayor and council has been a park isn't any good if no one wants to go to it an empty park is not a park so that's just green space. So the idea is we want to make sure we have something that's what the public wants to see and that we use. Well, Xavier, let's, let's, let's do it. Let's, let's not complain about it. Let's move forward because I, I know what is true is that everybody wants to see improvements made at, at Breckenridge Park. There's some low-hanging fruit, some maintenance issues, some historic upgrades that we need to make and we want to do those, but uh, uh, let, let's get this right from the get-go and uh, let's go out and see it in a way that creates a new model for us. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Councilman Medina. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, I'm very glad to hear that we are going to have an opportunity to slow this way down and uh, get uh, input from park users. Um, because, like as, as I said earlier, uh, Breckenridge Park is, is San Antonio's park. We've got to make sure that we get it right. It's coming upon us in the community when we get it right. So I'm glad that, that we're going we're gonna to go in and take a kind of a new approach and new model to this and, and uh, really have an opportunity to. Um, get it right for the residents that uh, have an expectation of what Brackenridge Park should be. So, um, you know, full steam ahead as the uh, evil does down at, uh, at the park, right? <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, exciting stuff and glad to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, and I'm assuming this is you know, doing council action on this? I mean, I'm sorry, committee action on this? Uh, yes, the action that we would ask the uh, committee to take today is to. Um, 
Confirm. Support or confirm the staff recommendation to remove the items that did not receive public support from the draft master plan and they go back and begin the uh, public process for those items that did receive public support so we can uh, hear the community, start that process, and then bring that back to the uh, Neighborhoods and Livability Committee with a recommendation that includes a public uh, input. I will, I will make that motion and, and um, you know, pay credit where credit is due to make the community for these positions to actually restart this. Okay. All right, we have a motion to uh, move forward on the items that have been supported and to discover the items that have not been supported. And also, uh, to begin a, a, a very innovative community uh, engagement piece that, that I think we all look forward to, and we're going to hold you to the to the fun part. Okay. Um, so, with that, uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. So, thank you, Xavier. Thanks uh, to again to your staff and all, all your help on this. Thank you, my dear, for, for, for all your support. We appreciate the community as well. Thank you. Thank well, you. Thank everybody as well in the community for, for all your support and uh, the Conservancy for being here tonight. And um, I know there was a question slide at the end, but we didn't quite get to the slide, and I had some questions. I don't know if anyone else did. Well, they, they, so the questions basically are oh, they're for the you committee. Guys. Okay. Uh, you're welcome to come talk to us afterwards. <laughs> okay. and we certainly uh, uh, we, we do offer a citizens to, to be heard, but you're welcome to come, come talk to us after this meeting. Well, this was my first meeting. I kind of missed all the other ones because I didn't hear about them until afterwards. So. Okay. Well, again, just know that we're reaffirming the, the, the community engagement piece. We look forward to talking to you. Uh, again, Maria Berestalo, thank you so much for all you've done. I uh, want to thank the, the, the design team, uh, Tim Morrow, for being here. Uh, again, staff. Uh, so with that, we'll move on to item number two.